to be completely blunt here, Brian, and there are plans to expand indoctrination. That's right. Well, Idahoans are also concerned. Horror shot. That line would be moving a little bit farther west. I'm like crying. Nobody wants to Dark see. Dark money is influencing policy in our state. Well, that's not how this works. Well, hello there. I'm Brian Hyde, and this is Nowhere to Hide. And we're going to be talking about one-size-fits-all education today, since school choice is front and center in a lot of people's minds, especially across the gem state. A uh, bill has passed uh, at least the House and is moving through the Senate now. And uh, yes, school choice may very well be on the horizon. However, it's not without a fair amount of opposition. And I'll give you some examples here. In fact, let's start with a, with a nice headline. This is uh, courtesy of our friends at Idaho Capital Sun. Divisive bill on education savings accounts heads to Idaho Senate floor. Now, why do I point this out? Well, because that's some pretty judgmental language right there in, in the headline. It's not just, you know, the fact that uh, education savings account bill or school choice bill heads to the Idaho Senate floor. It's a divisive one. This is, this is poisoning the well. So no matter what you uh, may think, you're being led to conclude that whatever this bill is, it's divisive. How many things that are divisive are really good? You can see just kind of a little subtle nudge in the right direction. This is why you always watch out for judgmental language in headlines. This is designed to set the stage for why no decent person would ever, you know, support such a divisive bill. Now, that's a pretty blatant one there, but let's let's dive into the story a little bit and see how they handle this. The Senate Education Committee sent a $45 million school choice bill to the Senate floor with a 6-3 to three vote Wednesday evening. The vote came on day two of public testimony on Senate Bill 1038, the controversial plan to establish a universal savings account program. So if the divisive part wasn't enough, you should know this is also controversial. Now look, in an opinion piece, that's great. This is supposed to be straight up news and it's supposed to be devoid of judgment. In other words, you're supposed to get just the facts of here's what happened. These are the facts of here's what is taking place. But as far as whether it's divisive, whether it's controversial, whether it's unicorns and sunshine, that is supposed to be your decision. Just nice to have a little help from our friends in the legacy media. I'm sure they, they can't help themselves, but they're trying to help us see what, what we are allowed to see. SB 1038 calls for $45 million of what uh, the Idaho Capital Sun calls state money. It's taxpayer money, but uh, we'll call it state money for the sake of this article. A hike from the original $19.4 million estimate to establish individual $5,950 per child scholarships for families of K-12 through students. That equates to about 80% of the amount allocated to public schools per student. The remaining 20% of the funding would stay within the school system. Now, I assume that Idaho is similar to other states in that their per pupil funding is worked out by how many warm bodies are actually sitting in seats. If, if I'm wrong on this, please correct me. I just understand this is a pretty standard way that the, the way we get the funding is we take count of how many butts are sitting in seats. And, you know, based on those numbers, that's that's how we get some of our funding. But it's interesting to note this would not be taking, you know, all of that money out. Still, there would be, you know, a considerable amount of money left. Parents could then put those funds toward approved education expenses, including private school tuition and fees, tutoring, counseling, and more. But access to the fund to access the funding, rather, a student cannot be enrolled in a public school. Now, students already outside the public school system, in other words, attending private schools, home schools, or religious schools, could apply for these savings accounts, as could students who choose to leave their public school if the legislation goes through. In Wednesday's meeting, the bill sponsored repeated the purpose of the legislation, which is to expand school choice in Idaho. Now, of course, there were different reasons that parents gave for why they, they want school choice for their children. For instance, Nicole Trakel of Caldwell, a supporter of SB 1038, said she thinks the bill would help with some of the issues in public school districts like overcrowding. But she also cited Idaho's low test scores and graduation rates, saying parents are seeking choice in an already imperfect system. It's not like we're asking for choice in an education system that is stellar and where students are doing well. We're asking for better choices that can give back to our state, that can give back to our communities, Trakel said. Now, you can imagine that probably uh, rubbed a few people the wrong way. What do you mean the system isn't perfect? But, you know, if you've seen the scores and, you know, it's, it's, it's very clear that uh, when you have, what, roughly 39% of eighth graders reading or doing math at, at uh, the, the proper grade level, you know, for all the money that is being put into the school system, 
it's not delivering the results that it should. Now, of course, as you're going to see, this doesn't mean that we aren't going to hear people complain about, well, they're just not fully funding the system, but it doesn't, it doesn't appear to matter how much money is put into the system. The, the problem is those test scores are still very low. And that's not to say that the system itself is an utter failure, but can you understand why parents would look at that and say, this is underperforming, or there, there may be something better or a better alternative that I would like to have access to? In fact, let's hear from a parent. This is a local father, Ryan Spoon, who spoke up about uh, why he wants school choice, as well as who does school choice really affect? I think he has a pretty solid take on this. Chairman Lent, Senators, thank you for having me today, and thank you for your consideration of this bill. I am here to speak in favor of Senate Bill 1038. I didn't want to repeat what everyone else is already saying, so I thought to myself, who, which demographic is not being addressed in the testimony so far? The homeschoolers and the way that this uh, bill strengthens their protections has been addressed. We talked about the current public school, uh, school students and how this bill does not take money away from public schools, how it actually leaves additional money per pupil in public schools. And I couldn't really find a demographic that has not yet been addressed. And then it occurred to me, the only demographic that has not been addressed is you. You and your 70 colleagues in the legislature. How are you affected by this bill? As you're painfully aware, you deal with your daily lives with complaints and conflict from your constituents. And why is that? When have you heard people complain about the lack of choice in how they spend their unemployment check? Or the lack of choice in how they spend food stamps? Or lack of choice in how they uh, take a Pell Grant to NNU or uh, College of Idaho instead of BSU or U of I. There's no complaint or conflict there because those people have choice. That's all that we're asking here. And we want to reduce the complaints and conflict that you have to deal with by giving your constituents choice. If somebody doesn't like critical race theory or if somebody doesn't like who's in loud and which bathrooms, find another school. There are many to choose from. There will be more if this bill is passed. Just give your constituents choice. That's all we ask. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spoon. That seems like a pretty reasonable way to frame this. And, and look, I understand there are people who, who, you know, rightly think, well, I think our kids should be exposed to CRT, or I think our kids need to have more diversity. They need to have access to books in their library that teach them how to engage in, you know, homosexual behavior or how to use sex toys when they're five years old, whatever. Not every parent is going to believe that, though. Not every parent wants that. And so when they want school choice, in some cases, there are parents saying, I'd like to get my kids out of a system that increasingly is taking a weird, hard turn to the left and going places where I really don't want them taking my child's mind. Now, who could possibly be against those parents exercising their choice? Well, if there are social engineers in the form of, you know, certain social justice warrior types, they would prefer that their captive audience remain captive. But let's see what some of the opponents to this, uh, this bill are saying. Wednesday's opponents included representatives from Idaho's largest education associations like, oh, the Idaho School Boards Association which right now is very busy with issues of gender identity and boys and girls restrooms and locker rooms and so forth and, and policies that, uh, you know, take the place or guidelines that take the place of policies that schools adopt that, uh, that carry the weight of actual policy without actually having to be on the record. Kind of sneaky stuff. Also, the Idaho Sc Association of School Administrators, several retired teachers testified against the bill, as did concerned taxpayers and public school parents. Now, most opponents repeated concerns about polling funding from public schools without any accountability measures. The bill makes it clear that beyond approving applications, the SDE would have no regulatory power over the approved providers. And I know for, for statists, that is quite a dilemma because anything that is not under the direct control of the state is by definition out of control. But here's something to consider. There is, it's not a lack of accountability. When these parents take that money, that, that education savings account, and they put it towards, whether it's a charter school, a private school, or some other form of schooling, the accountability comes when that school delivers or doesn't deliver on its promise to truly school and teach these kids. In other words, if they're getting crappy results, these parents have every right to pull their children out and take them somewhere else. 
That's the ultimate accountability. That is the accountability of the free market. And and I, I know it's it's painting with a broad brush here, but central planners tend to embrace things that are a little more socialist in nature, which is why one size fits all education is is their preferred approach. Well, of course, it'll fit everybody because we say so. And it's one size fits all because we say so. But where's the accountability there? When it's a monopoly, do you really have accountability? The answer is no. But parents who are actually taking money and putting it into their child's education, parents who are actually seeking choice because they're looking for a better alternative for their child, you better believe they will demand accountability. And if they don't get it, they'll take their business elsewhere. God bless the free market. It's it's the power of choice. Nobody forces you to buy a certain pair of shoes. Nobody bu- forces you to buy a certain color of car. Would you take your, your business to some place that did? You walk in the store, they point a gun at you. You're going to buy this or else. No, you wouldn't. You'd go somewhere where they treated you like a valued customer. That's what these parents are looking for. Senator Janie Ward, Elkin King, El- Engel King, rather, of Boise, combated Trakel- Trakel's argument. Idaho schools aren't failing, she said. Instead, according to Ward Engel King, the legislature has elected to not properly fund public education. That's a that's an ethereal phrase here. They haven't properly funded it. What exactly is the proper funding? I hear them say they must fully fund it. What exact what's the number? Name the number. Tell us when will enough be enough? Hint. It'll never be enough because it's a control mechanism. It's it's leverage. Well, you never give us enough money. So leads to crow- overcrowded schools, staffing shortages, and a myriad of other issues. But what about the kids actually learning something? I think it's it's pretty plain that, uh, you know, there's plenty of money that's been put into this. I like Brian Almond's take on it. All these teachers unions, public ad opponents of SB 1038, keep repeating the tired old line about schools being underfunded. Yet government keeps dumping billions of dollars into the government or the public school system. Sorry, Freudian slip there. It's It'll never be enough, and they will never get better without competition. That's a pretty true statement right there. Competition is what brings out the best. That's, that's ultimately what determines where you're going to go to get the things that you need, and that would include you know, things that you need for, for your child, including their, their education. I like how Senator Brian Lenny put it. This, this is about as straightforward as it gets. At the end of the day, that our education funding is meant for educating children, not for protecting particular institutions. Here, here. That's, that is, uh, that's something that I'm sure, you know, opponents of SB 1038 don't really want to hear, but that's, that's the truth. The real goal here is we want to see the kids get the best education. Competition is a way to accomplish that. But uh, it it means it's going to break up a monopoly. It's going to break up some people's power. We'll touch on that in just a moment. I thought this was interesting. This was this was a little side story that was was actually posted on the Idaho Capital Sun story. Uh, By the way, while you're being uh, told about this divisive and controversial bill, uh, here's another story. Records show powerful wealthy funders outside Idaho back school choice campaign. So my question is, uh, tell me about those wealthy out-of-state interests, teachers' unions, for instance, that back fighting school choice, that back one-size-fits-all education. Don't want to talk about that? Huh, I wonder why. Kind of a strange thing. And, of course, uh, you'll, you'll hear people talk about the Blaine Amendment. Well, the Blaine Amendment says you can't have any public money whatsoever going towards religious schools. Now, On the surface, most people would hear that and think, well, yeah, that sounds about right. We really don't want our public tax dollars supporting a church. But what do you know about the Blaine Amendment? What do you really know? Here's a very helpful graphic. I realize this is small. It may be difficult to read the the graphics, but the Blaine Amendment's in 60 seconds. So in 1875, President Grant said, not one dollar shall be appropriated to support sectarian schools. Now, in this case, Sectarian was referring specifically to Catholics. Why? Why did they care about Catholics? Well, because between, uh, what, about 1858 and, and 18, the late 1800s, um, the number of Catholics in America was uh, impressively increased by about, what, 14 million people? And politicians feared, oh, that's a big blo- voting block. And that's why they, they feared them voting as a block and they feared Catholic power. So, Following President Grant's uh, speech, Congressman James Blaine proposed an amendment to the U.S. Constitution saying no money raised by taxation should be used to support public schools. 
that are, it, it should not be under the control of or schools that are under the control of any uh, particular religious sect. Now, he made a very passionate speech about this. It failed to pass Congress, but individual states, I think it was 37 state constitutions, enacted their own form of Blaine amendments. But do you understand it was religious intolerance that was behind this? Louisiana actually repealed theirs back in, what, 1974. So this is an anti-religious relic that is still there. And much like Missouri finally, uh, you know, rescinded its extermination order, order against the Mormons a few years back. You know, maybe this is one of those things that uh, that needs to be repealed as well. And actually, I believe there is a bill that is making its way through the legislature that uh, would do exactly that and would, would help to uh, to take that relic off the books. But again, the, the real idea is, should education be one size fits all? Now, there's another story that was brought forth. This was in uh, IdahoEdNews.org. And I got to hand it, Kevin Reichert is, is a pretty strong enforcer of the establishment party line. He actually does a pretty fair job, and I got to give him kudos. This was a much more objective article than others that I've seen by him. Analysis, a fundamental discussion of what education means to Idahoans. Now, he delves into... The idea that it's no surprise the Senate Education Committee approved a controversial million education, $45 million education savings account bill. Even before the hearings began Tuesday, five of the committee's nine members had signed on as sponsors or co-sponsors. The outcome, Wednesday's 6-3 to three committee vote, was predictable. But he says the hearings were more than just a mere formality. Instead, they provided insight into how Idahoans look at their public schools and education's role in society. And as parents and instructors and taxpayers, how they feel about the, now this is this is a little slant here, the catchphrase of school choice. Is that what that is? Is it just a catchphrase? Okay. I thought maybe it was an idea or perhaps a concept. Supporters say the Idaho ESAs will put school choice into motion by putting money into the hands of parents. The $5,950 per student ESAs will make private school or homeschooling more affordable for parents. Market pressures, they say, will encourage innovation in public schools and drive out wokeness from the classroom. Competition is what provides the ultimate accountability, said Bill co-sponsor Senator Tammy Nichols of Middleton as she wrapped up committee debate on Wednesday. Competition, huh? Here's a thought from the Center for American Education, actually from an article that they shared on Twitter. School choice benefits the teachers, too. When public schools have to compete with private schools, charter schools, and other institutions, they have to give teachers a better deal. So more options for students also means more options for those instructing students. Doesn't that make sense? Wouldn't it make sense that the best teachers would rise to the top instead of teachers clamoring for, I want the smallest possible classroom? The really great teachers would be clamoring to teach as many students as they could. Now, again, in the public school system, that's seen as a horrible thing. Why, well, there's just too many students here. How can we possibly manage the classroom? And yet, uh, in, in private schools and in online schools, teachers uh, handle much larger numbers of students. What kind of educational experience are they getting? If it's a better experience, then that says something about the quality of the teaching, wouldn't it? All right, back to the story. Critics say competition is a false promise, especially in rural communities where private and parochial school offerings are scarce. As their argument goes, the ESA programs will use, again, state dollars, that's taxpayer dollars, to subsidize private schools in urban areas at the expense of rural schools. As the ESA program grows and its price tag swells, they say rural schools will have no choice but to go back to the taxpayers for help. Let me try another scenario on you. What if instead... That competition actually provided incentive for someone who is able to build a better mousetrap, so to speak, to go into rural communities, offering those educational choices. Seems to me it would be a ripe market. If it's a need that's not being met, see, this is where the free market excels in bringing forth better solutions to reach more people at better prices and give them the better product. That's what competition encourages. Are we to believe that, oh, no, those rural communities, why, everybody will just turn their backs? It's just, it's flyover country. Not to a person who is entrepreneurial and a person who recognizes, hey, that's a need that I could fill. And we could be talking about systems that have yet to even be devised. But that's the beauty of competition. I like this take from my friend Connor Boyack. Monopolists always hate to lower power and market share. Just as taxis fought Uber and Lyft, you remember the, the controversy about that? Today, it's the teachers' unions fighting school choice reforms that empower families to choose alternative education options. 
yeah, the, the taxi companies, you know, we got these medallions and we, we have paid a lot of money for those and we have political influence and you know, it's protectionism. That's exactly what it is. Barriers to new people coming into the market. And yet Uber and Lyft came in and for a while there, I mean, you had police doing undercover sting operations in various cities. If somebody showed up to pick up a, you know, an Uber rider, well, we're going to arrest you because you don't have the proper medallion, the proper, uh, you know, the proper permission from the state. And it was just, it was a political racket. Well, for your money, you know, if you pay tribute, you know, we'll be able to let you do business here. And the crazy thing was the taxi companies, they had a great incentive to improve their own product. I mean, if you've ever taken a really crappy taxi ride, ridden in a filthy taxi cab, or, you know, had a surly driver because there really was no competition, the Uber and Lyft model turned that on its head. Why? Because the competition was the better you were as a driver, the better you treated your passengers, the better they rated you, the better you like, the more likely you were to get to, you know, better customers. People would actually seek you out. That's the beauty of competition. Why wouldn't that apply in terms of what's happening, you know, in, in our schools? Now, it's quite possible that SB 1038 isn't the last school choice bill of the year. And this is this is where things start to get a little bit tricky. This is so important that we protect that one size fits all education approach that uh, there are other alternatives, watered down alternatives that are being proposed. Well, maybe we can give them something that'll, you know, throw a bone to the, to the people who want school choice without actually having to change things. Casting his vote against SB 1038, a proposal that is, quote, probably too much too fast. <laughs> that's, a, that's a person who is losing control and doesn't like it. Senate Education Chairman Dave Land of Idaho Falls hinted at other proposals waiting in the wings and carrying a smaller price tag. You know what the, the price tag is, though? Of, of these education savings accounts compared to the overall hundreds of millions of dollars that are being put into public education, government school education. It's a tiny, tiny fraction. Would they be so uh, fiscally concerned if it didn't offer choice? Probably not. For now, SB 1038 is the bill up for debate. This week's debate prompted dozens of Idahoans to talk about something more fundamental, and that is what education means to them. Now, it also brought up a possibility of some uh, hijinks taking place. And this is where, uh, thank goodness, uh, the Idaho Freedom Foundation is paying attention. Uh, President uh, Wayne Hoffman from the Idaho Freedom Foundation actually wrote a letter to uh, Speaker Moyle about a situation that had come to his attention. Dear Speaker Moyle, as you know, House Rule 26 requires that all committee meetings be conducted in public, except in those cases in which an executive session is required and only when necessitated by extraordinary circumstances as provided in the rule. The Idaho Freedom Foundation has been made aware of the fact, the fact that House Education Chairman Julie Yamamoto has issued instructions to her committee that appear to be in violation of this rule. In a February 16th email to the committee, she notes that as many as four education savings account proposals will be considered by the committee. She writes, when you have determined which proposal you prefer to have introduced, please email, text, or drop by my office so that I can record your choice. Oh, well, that's nice. Now, Wayne says this statement describes a mechanism in which a vote is taking place outside of public view. Now, while she doesn't call it a vote, the committee is clearly being instructed to vote. It's also concerning that she adds that she does not intend to publicize your choice, which is essentially a secret vote violative of both the rule and the state's consti state constitution's prohibition on secret sessions of the legislature. House Rule 26 in delineating what kinds of meetings should be afforded the secrecy of an executive session does not allow for one conducting general committee business. Furthermore, House Rule 26 requires a two-thirds vote for any executive session, and the rule specifically says that under no circumstances, however, shall an executive session be authorized or held for the purpose of taking any final action or making any final decision, and during such executive session, no votes or official action may be taken. Now, a final note here, if the open meeting laws were to be applied to legislative committees, this would be the very definition of serial meetings which are illegal under Idaho's statutes. Chairman Yamamoto appears to have authorized an executive session that is not warranted, using a mechanism not allowed under the rule, and has directed committee members to take the improper step of casting a secret ballot in order to introduce legislation. We ask you to see to it that Chairman Yamamoto rescinds her email and be directed to conduct the committee's business and votes in the open so the public can hold their elected officials accountable. 
You know, it wasn't so long we, ago we were looking at uh, a former Senator Mary Souza complaining about, it's so unfair how the Idaho Freedom Foundation, you know, holds us accountable for these kind of things. But this is why. Because sometimes lawmakers are tempted to cut corners and to do things in secret or to try to shield themselves from making their actions and their votes as transparent and public as possible. It needs to be done in the light of day. And thank goodness you have organizations like the Idaho Freedom Foundation standing up, calling it out when it needs to be called out. I know that, you know, our, our friend Brian Holmes from KTVB, well, this is just schoolyard bullying. Nope, this is responsible citizenship. And when lawmakers are engaging in hinky behavior, they need to be called out. They need to be corrected. And frankly, that's about as diplomatic and gentle a correction as, as possible. So if you see that as bullying or you see that as unreasonable, how dare you call them, you know, call them out on this. It needs to take place. There's a lot that's at stake here. At, at the very least, you know, it's, it's children's education. And now you hopefully have a little bit stronger understanding of what's at stake in the school choice debate. Okay, nothing is written in stone at this point, and it could still go a number of ways. But it's nice to see some traction coming through. It's nice to see that in spite of the fear campaigns and all the, the attempts to, to paint this off as, you know, somehow it's just, you know, dark money from out-of-state interests trying to influence, you know, how our kids learn and to take away their opportunities. No, there's actually, there's some pretty sound reasoning behind why competition is good, why school choice is good, and how it could actually help the public school system become a better version of itself. We just got to get through to the bureaucrats that, uh, you know, there's there's a, a better opportunity on the other side of that school choice. But for some reason, they don't seem to want to embrace it. I'm Brian Hyde, and this is Nowhere to Hide. Are biased, the Idaho Press Club are biased, all media, newspaper, radio. To be completely blunt here, Brian, and there are plans to expand indoctrination. That's right. Well, Idahoans are also concerned. Horror shot. That line would be moving a little bit farther west. I'm like crying. Nobody wants to Dark see. Dark money is influencing policy in our state. Well, that's not how this works.